section twenty seven of the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt by franklin d roosevelt july twenty eighth nineteen forty three my fellow americans over a year and a half ago i said this to the congress the militarists in berlin and rome and tokyo started this war but the massed angered forces of common humanity will finish it Today, that prophecy is in the process of being fulfilled the massed angered forces of common humanity are on the march they are going forward on the russian front in the vast pacific area and into europe converging upon their ultimate objectives berlin and tokyo i think the first crack in the axis has come the criminal corrupt fascist regime in italy is going to pieces the pirate philosophy of the fascists and the nazis cannot stand adversity the military superiority of the united nations on sea and land and in the air has been applied in the right place and at the right time hitler refused to send sufficient help to save mussolini in fact hitler's troops in sicily stole the italians motor equipment leaving italian soldiers so stranded that they had no choice but to surrender once again the germans betrayed their italian allies as they had done time and time again on the russian front and in the long retreat from egypt through libya and tripoli to the final surrender in tunisia and so mussolini came to the reluctant conclusion that the jig was up he could see the shadow of the long arm of justice but he and his fascist gang will be brought to book and punished for their crimes against humanity no criminal will be allowed to escape by the expedient of resignation so our terms to italy are still the same as our terms to germany and japan unconditional surrender we will have no truck with fascism in any way in any shape or manner we will permit no vestige of fascism to remain eventually italy will reconstitute herself it will be the people of italy who will do that choosing their own government in accordance with the basic democratic principles of liberty and equality in the meantime the united nations will not follow the pattern set by mussolini and hitler and the japanese for the treatment of occupied countries the pattern of pillage and starvation we are already helping the italian people in sicily with their cordial cooperation we are establishing and maintaining security and order we are dissolving the organizations which have kept them under fascist tyranny we are providing them with the necessities of life until the time comes when they can fully provide for themselves indeed the people in sicily today are rejoicing in the fact that for the first time in years they are permitted to enjoy the fruits of their own labors they can eat what they themselves grow instead of having it stolen from them by the fascists and the nazis in every country conquered by the nazis and the fascists or the japanese militarists the people have been reduced to the status of slaves or chattels it is our determination to restore these conquered peoples to the dignity of human beings masters of their own fate entitled to freedom of speech freedom of religion freedom from want and freedom from fear we have started to make good on that promise i am sorry if i step on the toes of those americans who playing party politics at home call that kind of foreign policy crazy altruism and starry-eyed dreaming meanwhile the war in sicily and italy goes on it must go on and will go on until the italian people realize the futility of continuing to fight in a lost cause a cause to which the people of italy never gave their wholehearted approval and support it is a little over a year since we planned the north african campaign it is six months since we planned the sicilian campaign i confess that i am of an impatient disposition but i think that i understand and that most people understand the amount of time necessary to prepare for any major military or naval operation we cannot just pick up the telephone 
and order a new campaign to start the next week for example behind the invasion forces in north africa the invasion forces that went out of north africa were thousands of ships and planes guarding the long perilous sea lanes carrying the men carrying the equipment and the supplies to the point of attack and behind all these were the railroad lines and the highways here back home that carried the men and the munitions to the ports of embarkation there were the factories and the mines and the farms here back home that turned out the materials there were the training camps here back home where the men learned how to perform the strange and difficult and dangerous tasks which were to meet them on the beaches and in the deserts and in the mountains all this had to be repeated first in north africa and then in the attack on sicily here the factor in sicily the factor of air attack was added for we could use north africa as the base for softening up the landing places and lines of defense in sicily and the lines of supply in italy it is interesting for us to realize that every flying fortress that bombed harbor installations at for example naples from its base in north africa required one thousand one hundred ten gallons of gasoline for each single mission and that this is the equal of about three hundred seventy five a ration tickets enough gas to drive your car five times across this continent you will better understand your part in the war and what gasoline rationing means if you multiply this by the gasoline needs of thousands of planes and hundreds of thousands of jeeps and trucks and tanks that are now serving overseas i think that the personal convenience of the individual or the individual family back home here in the united states will appear somewhat less important when i tell you that the initial assault force on sicily involved three thousand ships which carried one hundred sixty thousand men americans british canadians and french together with fourteen thousand vehicles six hundred tanks and one thousand eight hundred guns and this initial force was followed every day and every night by thousands of reinforcements the meticulous care with which the operation in sicily was planned has paid dividends our casualties in men in ships and material have been low in fact far below our estimate and all of us are proud of the superb skill and courage of the officers and men who have conducted and are conducting those operations the toughest resistance developed on the front of the british eighth army which included the canadians but that is no new experience for that magnificent fighting force which has made the germans pay a heavy price for each hour of delay in the final victory the american seventh army after a stormy landing on the exposed beaches of southern sicily swept with record speed across the island into the capital at palermo for many of our troops this was their first battle experience but they have carried themselves like veterans and we must give credit for the coordination of the diverse forces in the field and for the planning of the whole campaign to the wise and skillful leadership of general eisenhower admiral cunningham general alexander and sir marshal tedder have been towers of strength in handling the complex details of naval and ground and air activities you have heard some people say that the british and the americans can never get along well together you have heard some people say that the army and the navy and the air forces can never get along well together that real cooperation between them is impossible tunisia and sicily have given the lie once and for all to these narrow-minded prejudices the dauntless fighting spirit of the british people in this war has been expressed in the historic words and deeds of winston churchill and the world knows how the american people feel about him ahead of us are much bigger fights we and our allies will go into them as we went into sicily together and we shall carry on together today our production of ships is almost unbelievable this year we are producing over nineteen million tons of merchant shipping and next year our production will be over twenty one million tons and in addition to our shipments across the atlantic we must realize that in this war we are operating in the aleutians in the distant parts of the southwest pacific in india and off the shores of south america 
for several months we have been losing fewer ships by sinkings and we have been destroying more and more u-boats we hope this will continue but we cannot be sure we must not lower our guard for one single instant our tangible result of our great increase in merchant shipping which i think will be good news to civilians at home is that to-night we are able to terminate the rationing of coffee we also expect that within a short time we shall get greatly increased allowances of sugar those few americans who grouse and complain about the inconveniences of life here in the united states should learn some lessons from the civilian populations of our allies britain and china and russia and of all the lands occupied by our common enemy the heaviest and most decisive fighting today is going on in russia i am glad that the british and we have been able to contribute somewhat to the great striking power of the russian armies in nineteen forty one to nineteen forty two the russians were able to retire without breaking to move many of their war plants from western russia far into the interior to stand together with complete unanimity in the defense of their homeland the success of the russian armies has shown that it is dangerous to make prophecies about them a fact which has been forcibly brought home to that mystic master of strategic intuition herr hitler the short-lived german offensive launched early this month was a desperate attempt to bolster the morale of the german people the russians were not fooled by this they went ahead with their own plans for attack plans which coordinate with the whole united nations offensive strategy the world has never seen greater devotion determination and self-sacrifice than have been displayed by the russian people and their armies under the leadership of marshal joseph stalin with the nation which in saving itself is thereby helping to save all the world from the nazi menace this country of ours should always be glad to be a good neighbor and a sincere friend in the world of the future in the pacific we are pushing the japs around from the aleutians to new guinea there too we have taken the initiative and we are not going to let go of it it becomes clearer and clearer that the attrition the whittling down process against the japanese is working the japs have lost more planes and more ships than they have been able to replace the continuous and energetic prosecution of the war of attrition will drive the japs back from their overextended line running from burma and siam and the straits settlement through the netherlands indies to eastern new guinea and the solomons and we have good reason to believe that their shipping and their air power cannot support such outposts our naval and land and air strength in the pacific is constantly growing and if the japanese are basing their future plans for the pacific on a long period in which they will be permitted to consolidate and exploit their conquered resources they had better start revising their plans now i give that to them merely as a helpful suggestion we are delivering planes and vital war supplies for the heroic armies of generalissimo shang kai shek and we must do more at all costs our air supply line from india to china across enemy territory continues despite attempted japanese interference we have seized the initiative from the japanese in the air over burma and now we enjoy superiority we are bombing japanese communications supply dumps and bases in china in indochina in burma but we are still far from our main objectives in the war against japan let us remember however how far we were a year ago from any of our objectives in the european theatre we are pushing forward to occupation of positions which in time will enable us to attack the japanese islands themselves from the north from the south from the east and from the west you have heard it said that while we are succeeding greatly on the fighting front we are failing miserably on the home front i think this is another of those immaturities a false slogan easy to state but untrue in the essential facts for the longer this war goes on the clearer it becomes that no one can draw a blue pencil down the middle of a page and call one side the fighting front and the other side the home front for the two of them are inexorably tied together every combat division every naval task force every squadron of fighting planes is dependent for its equipment and ammunition 
and fuel and food as indeed it is for its manpower dependent on the american people in civilian clothes in the offices and in the factories and on the farms at home the same kind of careful planning that gained victory in north africa and sicily is required if we are to make victory an enduring reality and do our share in building the kind of peaceful world that will justify the sacrifices made in this war the united nations are substantially agreed on the general objectives for the post-war world they are also agreed that this is not the time to engage in an international discussion of all the terms of peace and all the details of the future let us win the war first we must not relax our pressure on the enemy by taking time out to define every boundary and settle every political controversy in every part of the world the important thing the all-important thing now is to get on with the war and to win it while concentrating on military victory we are not neglecting the planning of the things to come the freedoms which we know will make for more decency and greater justice throughout the world among many other things we are to-day laying plans for the return to civilian life of our gallant men and women in the armed services they must not be demobilized into an environment of inflation and unemployment to a place on a bread line or on a corner selling apples we must this time have plans ready instead of waiting to do a hasty inefficient and ill-considered job at the last moment i have assured our men in the armed forces that the american people would not let them down when the war is won i hope that the congress will help in carrying out this assurance for obviously the executive branch of the government cannot do it alone may the congress do its duty in this regard the american people will insist on fulfilling this american obligation to the men and women in the armed forces who are winning this war for us of course the returning soldier and sailor and marine are part of the problem of demobilizing the rest of the millions of americans who have been working and living in a war economy since nineteen forty one that larger objective of reconverting wartime america to a peacetime basis is one for which your government is laying plans to be submitted to the congress for action but the members of the armed forces have been compelled to make greater economic sacrifice and every other kind of sacrifice than the rest of us and they are entitled to definite action to help take care of their special problems the least to which they are entitled it seems to me is something like this first mustering out pay to every member of the armed forces and merchant marine when he or she is honorably discharged mustering out pay large enough in each case to cover a reasonable period of time between his discharge and the finding of a new job second in case no job is found after diligent search then unemployment insurance if the individual registers with the united states employment service third an opportunity for members of the armed services to get further education or trade training at the cost of the government fourth allowance of credit to all members of the armed forces under unemployment compensation and federal old age and survivors insurance for their period of service for these purposes they ought to be treated as if they had continued their employment in private industry fifth improved and liberalized provisions for hospitalization for rehabilitation for medical care of disabled members of the armed forces and the merchant marine and finally sufficient pensions for disabled members of the armed forces your government is drawing up other serious constructive plans for certain immediate forward moves they concern food manpower and other domestic problems that tie in with our armed forces within a few weeks i shall speak with you again in regard to definite actions to be taken by the executive branch of the government and specific recommendations for new legislation by the congress all our calculations for the future however must be based on clear understanding of the problems involved and that can be gained only by straight thinking not guesswork not political manipulation i confess that i myself am sometimes bewildered by conflicting statements that i see in the press one day i read an authoritative statement 
that we shall win the war this year nineteen forty three and the next day comes another statement equally authoritative that the war will still be going on in nineteen forty nine of course both extremes of optimism and pessimism are wrong the length of the war will depend upon the uninterrupted continuance of all-out effort on the fighting fronts and here at home and that effort is all one the american soldier does not like the necessity of waging war and yet if he lays off for one single instant he may lose his own life and sacrifice the lives of his comrades by the same token a worker here at home may not like the driving wartime conditions under which he has to work and live and yet if he gets complacent or indifferent and slacks on his job he too may sacrifice the lives of american soldiers and contribute to the loss of an important battle the next time anyone says to you that this war is in the bag or says it's all over but the shouting you should ask him these questions are you working full-time on your job are you growing all the food you can are you buying your limit of war bonds are you loyally and cheerfully cooperating with your government in preventing inflation and profiteering and in making rationing work with fairness to all because if your answer is no then the war is going to last a lot longer than you think the plans we made for the knocking out of mussolini and his gang have largely succeeded but we still have to knock out hitler and his gang and tojo and his gang no one of us pretends that this will be an easy matter we still have to defeat hitler and tojo on their own home grounds but this will require a far greater concentration of our national energy and our ingenuity and our skill it is not too much to say that we must pour into this war the entire strength and intelligence and willpower of the united states we are a great nation a rich nation but we are not so great or so rich that we can afford to waste our substance or the lives or our men by relaxing along the way we shall not settle for less than total victory that is the determination of every american on the fighting fronts that must be and will be the determination of every american here at home end of section twenty seven Section 28 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. September 8, 1943 my fellow americans once upon a time a few years ago there was a city in our middle west which was threatened by a destructive flood in the great river the waters had risen to the top of the banks every man woman and child in that city was called upon to fill sandbags in order to defend their homes against the rising waters for many days and nights destruction and death stared them in the face as a result of the grim determined community effort that city still stands those people kept the levees above the peak of the flood all of them joined together in a desperate job that had to be done businessmen workers farmers doctors and preachers people of all races to me, that town is a living symbol of what community cooperation can accomplish. Today, in the same kind of community effort, only very much larger, the United Nations and their peoples have kept the levees of civilization high enough to prevent the floods of aggression and barbarism and wholesale murder from engulfing us all. The flood has been raging for four years. At last we are beginning to gain on it, but the waters have not yet receded enough for us to relax our sweating work with the sandbags. In this war bond, 
campaign we are filling bags and placing them against the flood bags which are essential if we are to stand off the ugly torrent which is trying to sweep us all away today it is announced that an armistice with italy has been concluded this was a great victory for the united nations but it was also a great victory for the italian people after years of war and suffering and degradation the italian people are at last coming to the day of liberation from their real enemies the nazis but let us not delude ourselves from this armistice means the end of the war in the mediterranean we still have to drive the germans out of italy as we have driven them out of tunisia and sicily but we must drive them out of france and all other captive countries and we must strike them on their own soil from all directions our ultimate objectives in this war continue to be berlin and tokyo i ask you to bear these objectives constantly in mind and do not forget that we still have a long way to go before we attain them the great news that you have heard today from general eisenhower does not give you license to settle back in your rocking chairs and say well that does it we've got him on the run now we can start the celebration the time for celebration is not yet and i have suspicion that when this war does end we shall not be in a very celebrating mood a very celebrating frame of mind I think that our main emotion will be one of grim determination that this shall not happen again. During the past weeks, Mr. Churchill and I have been in constant conference with the leaders of our combined fighting forces. We have been in constant communication with our fighting allies, Russian and Chinese, who are prosecuting the war with relentless determination and with conspicuous success on far distant fronts. And Mr. Churchill and I are here together in Washington at this crucial moment. We have seen the satisfactory fulfillment of plans that were made in Casablanca last January and here in Washington last May. And lately we have made new extensive plans for the future. But throughout these conferences, we have never lost sight of the fact that this war will become bigger and tougher rather than easier during the long months that are to come. This war does not and must not stop for one single instant. Your fighting men know that. Those of them who are moving forward through jungles against lurking Japs, those who are landing at this moment in barges, moving through the dawn up to strange enemy coasts those who are diving their bombers down on the targets at the rooftop levels at this moment every one of these men knows that this war is a full-time job and it will continue to be that until total victory is won and by the same token every responsible leader in all the united nations knows that the fighting goes on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that any day lost may have to be paid for in terms of months added to the duration of the war. Every campaign, every single operation in all the campaigns that we plan and carry through must be figured in terms of staggering material costs. We cannot afford to be niggardly with any of our resources, for we shall need all of them to do the job that we have put our shoulder to. Your fellow Americans have given a magnificent account of themselves on the battlefields and on the oceans and in the skies all over the world. Now it is up to you to prove to them that you are contributing your share and more than your share. It is not sufficient to simply put into war bonds money which we would normally save. We must put into war bonds money which we would not normally save. 
Only then we have done everything that good conscience demands, so that it is up to you, up to you, the Americans, in the American homes, the very homes which our sons and daughters are working and fighting and dying to preserve. I know I speak for every man and woman throughout the Americas when I say that the Americas will not be satisfied to send our troops into the fire of the enemy with equipment inferior in any way, nor will we be satisfied to send our troops with equipment that only equal to that of the enemy. We are determined to provide our troops with overpowering superiority, superiority of quantity and quality in any and every category of arms and armaments that they may conceivably need. And where does this our dominating power come from? Why, it can only come from you. The money you lend and the money you give in taxes buys that death-dealing and at the same time life-saving power that we need for victory. This is an expensive war, expensive in money. You can help it. You can help to keep it at a minimum cost in lives. The American people will never stop to reckon the cost of redeeming civilization. They know there can never be any economic justification for failing to save freedom. We can be sure that our enemies will watch this drive with the keenest interest. They know that the success in this undertaking will shorten the war. They know the more money the American people lend to the governments, the more powerful and relentless will be the American forces in the field. They know that only a united and determined America could possibly produce on voluntary basis so huge a sum of money as $15 billion. The overwhelming success of the Second War Loan Drive last April showed that the people of this democracy stood firm behind their troops. This Third War Loan, which we are starting tonight, will also succeed because the American people will not permit it to fail. I cannot tell you how much to invest in war bonds during this third war loan drive. No one can tell you. It is for you to decide under the guidance of your own conscience. I will say this, however. Because the nation's needs are greater than ever before, our sacrifices, too, must be greater than they have ever been before. Nobody knows when total victory will come, but we do know that the harder we fight now, the more might and power we direct at the enemy, now the shorter the war will be, and the smaller the sum total of sacrifice. Success of the Third War Loan will be the symbol that America does not propose to rest on its arms, that we know the tough, bitter job ahead, and will not stop until we have finished it. Now it's your turn. Every dollar that you invest in the Third War Loan is your personal message of defiance to our common enemies, to the ruthless savages of Germany and Japan, and it is your personal message of faith and good cheer to our allies and all the men at the front. God bless them. End of section 28. Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee. Section 29 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. December 24, 1943. My friends, I have recently returned from extensive journeying in the region of the Mediterranean and as far as the borders of Russia. I have conferred with the leaders of Britain and Russia and China on military matters of the present, 
especially on plans for stepping up our successful attack on our enemies as quickly as possible and from many different points of the compass on this christmas eve there are over ten million men in the armed forces of the united states alone one year ago one million seven hundred thousand were serving overseas today this figure has been more than doubled to three million eight hundred thousand on duty overseas by next july first that number will rise to over five million men and women that this is truly a world war was demonstrated to me when arrangements were being made with our overseas broadcasting agencies for the time to speak today to our soldiers and sailors and marines and merchant seamen in every part of the world in fixing the time for this broadcast we took into consideration that at this moment here in the united states and in the caribbean and on the northeast coast of south america it is afternoon in alaska and in hawaii and the mid-pacific it is still morning in iceland in great britain in north africa in italy and the middle east it is now evening in the southwest pacific in australia in china and burma and india it is already christmas day so we can correctly say that at this moment in those far eastern parts where americans are fighting today is tomorrow but everywhere throughout the world throughout this war that covers the world there is a special spirit that has warmed our hearts since our earliest childhood a spirit that brings us close to our homes our families our friends and neighbors the christmas spirit of peace on earth good will toward men it is an unquenchable spirit during the past years of international gangsterism and brutal aggression in europe and in asia our christmas celebrations have been darkened with apprehension for the future we have said merry christmas a happy new year but we have known in our hearts that the clouds which have hung over our world have prevented us from saying it with full sincerity and conviction and even this year we still have much to face in the way of further suffering and sacrifice and personal tragedy our men who have been through the fierce battles in the solomons and the gilberts and tunisia and italy know from their own experience and knowledge of modern war that many bigger and costlier battles are still to be fought but on christmas eve this year i can say to you that at last we may look forward into the future with real substantial confidence that however great the cost peace on earth good will toward men can be and will be realized and ensured this year i can say that last year i could not do more than express a hope today i express a certainty though the cost may be high and the time may be long within the past year within the past few weeks history has been made and it is far better history for the whole human race than any we have known or even dared to hope for in these tragic times through which we pass a great beginning was made in the moscow conference last october by mr molotov mr eden and our own mr hull there and then the way was paved for the later meetings at cairo and tehran we devoted ourselves not only to military matters we devoted ourselves also to consideration of the future to plans for the kind of world which alone can justify all the sacrifices of this war of course as you all know mr churchill and i have happily met many times before and we know and understand each other very well indeed mr churchill has become known and beloved by many millions of americans and the heartfelt prayers of all of us have been with this great citizen of the world in his recent serious illness the cairo and tehran conferences however gave me my first opportunity to meet the generalissimo chiang kai shek and marshal stalin and to sit down at the table with these unconquerable men and talk with them face to face we had planned to talk to each other across the table at cairo and tehran but we soon found that we were all on the same side of the table we came to the conferences with faith in each other but we needed the personal contact and now we have supplemented faith with definite knowledge it was well worth traveling thousands of miles over land and sea to bring about this personal meeting and to gain the heartening assurance that we are absolutely agreed with one another on all the major objectives 
and on the military means of obtaining them at cairo prime minister churchill and i spent four days with the generalissimo chiang kai shek it was the first time that we had had an opportunity to go over the complex situation in the far east with him personally we were able not only to settle upon definite military strategy but also to discuss certain long-range principles which we believe can assure peace in the far east for many generations to come those principles are as simple as they are fundamental they involve the restoration of stolen property to its rightful owners and the recognition of the rights of millions of people in the far east to build up their own forms of self-government without molestation essential to all peace and security in the pacific and in the rest of the world is the permanent elimination of the empire of japan as a potential force of aggression never again must our soldiers and sailors and marines and other soldiers sailors and marines be compelled to fight from island to island as they are fighting so gallantly and so successfully today increasingly powerful forces are now hammering at the japanese at many points over an enormous arc which curves down through the pacific from the aleutians to the jungles of burma our own army and navy our air forces the australians and new zealanders the dutch and the british land air and sea forces are all forming a band of steel which is slowly but surely closing in on japan on the mainland of asia under the generalissimo's leadership the chinese ground and air forces augmented by american air forces are playing a vital part in starting the drive which will push the invaders into the sea following out the military decisions at cairo general marshall has just flown around the world and has had conferences with general MacArthur and admiral nimitz conferences which will spell plenty of bad news for the japs in the not too far distant future i met in the generalissimo a man of great vision great courage and a remarkably keen understanding of the problems of today and tomorrow we discussed all the manifold military plans for striking at japan with decisive force from many directions and i believe i can say that he returned to chungking with the positive assurance of total victory over our common enemy today we and the republic of china are closer together than ever before in deep friendship and in unity of purpose after the cairo conference mr churchill and i went by airplane to tehran there we met with marshal stalin we talked with complete frankness on every conceivable subject connected with the winning of the war and the establishment of a durable peace after the war within three days of intense and consistently amicable discussions we agreed on every point concerned with the launching of a gigantic attack upon germany the russian army will continue its stern offensives on germany's eastern front the allied armies in italy and africa will bring relentless pressure on germany from the south and now the encirclement will be complete as great american and british forces attack from other points of the compass the commander selected to lead the combined attack from these other points is general dwight d eisenhower his performances in africa in sicily and in italy have been brilliant he knows by practical and successful experience the way to coordinate air sea and land power all of these will be under his control lieutenant general carl d spatz will command the entire american strategic bombing force operating against germany general eisenhower gives up his command in the mediterranean to a british officer whose name is being announced by mr churchill we now pledge that new commander that our powerful ground sea and air forces in the vital mediterranean area will stand by his side until every objective in that bitter theater is attained both of these new commanders will have american and british subordinate commanders whose names will be announced to the world in a few days during the last two days at tehran marshal stalin mr churchill and i looked ahead ahead to the days and months and years that will follow germany's defeat we were united in determination that germany must be stripped of her military might and be given no opportunity within the foreseeable future to regain that might the united nations have no intention to enslave the german people we wish them to have a normal chance to develop in peace 
as useful and respectable members of the european family but we most certainly emphasize that word respectable for we intend to rid them once and for all of nazism and prussian militarism and the fantastic and disastrous notion that they constitute the master race we did discuss international relationships from the point of view of big broad objectives rather than details but on the basis of what we did discuss i can say even today that i do not think any insoluble differences will arise among russia great britain and the united states in these conferences we were concerned with basic principles principles which involve the security and the welfare and the standard of living or human beings in countries large and small to use an american and somewhat ungrammatical colloquialism i may say that i got along fine with marshal stalin he is a man who combines a tremendous relentless determination with a stalwart good humor i believe he is truly representative of the heart and soul of russia and i believe that we are going to get along very well with him and the russian people very well indeed britain russia china and the united states and their allies represent more than three-quarters of the total population of the earth as long as these four nations with great military power stick together in determination to keep the peace there will be no possibility of an aggressor nation arising to start another world war but those four powers must be united with and cooperate with all the freedom-loving peoples of europe and asia and africa and the americas the rights of every nation large or small must be respected and guarded as jealously as are the rights of every individual within our own republic the doctrine that the strong shall dominate the weak is the doctrine of our enemies and we reject it but at the same time we are agreed that if force is necessary to keep international peace international force will be applied for as long as it may be necessary it has been our steady policy and it is certainly a common-sense policy that the right of each nation to freedom must be measured by the willingness of that nation to fight for freedom and today we salute our unseen allies in occupied countries the underground resistance groups and the armies of liberation they will provide potent forces against our enemies when the day of the counter-invasion comes through the development of science the world has become so much smaller that we have had to discard the geographical yardsticks of the past for instance through our early history the atlantic and pacific oceans were believed to be walls of safety for the united states time and distance made it physically possible for example for us and for the other american republics to obtain and maintain our independence against infinitely stronger powers until recently very few people even military experts thought that the day would ever come when we might have to defend our pacific coast against japanese threats of invasion at the outbreak of the first world war relatively few people thought that our ships and shipping would be menaced by german submarines on the high seas or that the german militarists would ever attempt to dominate any nation outside of central europe after the armistice in 1918 we thought and hoped that the militaristic philosophy of germany had been crushed and being full of the milk of human kindness we spent the next twenty years disarming while the germans whined so pathetically that the other nations permitted them and even helped them to rearm for too many years we lived on pious hopes that aggressor and warlike nations would learn and understand and carry out the doctrine of purely voluntary peace the well-intentioned but ill-fated experiments of former years did not work it is my hope that we will not try them again no that is putting it too weakly it is my intention to do all that i humanly can as president and commander-in-chief to see to it that these tragic mistakes shall not be made again they have always been cheerful idiots in this country who believed that there would be no more war for us if everybody in america would only return into their homes and lock their front doors behind them assuming that their motives were of the highest events have been shown how unwilling they were to face the facts the overwhelming majority of all the people in the world want peace most of them are fighting for the attainment of peace not just a truce not just an armistice 
but peace that is as strongly enforced and as durable as mortal man can make it if we are willing to fight for peace now is it not good logic that we should use force if necessary in the future to keep the peace that the other three great nations who are fighting so magnificently to gain peace are in complete agreement that we must be prepared to keep the peace by force if the people of germany and japan are made to realize thoroughly that the world is not going to let them break out again it is possible and i hope probable that they will abandon the philosophy of aggression the belief that they can gain the whole world even at the risk of losing their own souls i shall have more to say about the cairo and tehran conferences when i make my report to the congress in about two weeks time and on that occasion i shall also have a great deal to say about certain conditions here at home but today i wish to say that in all my travels at home and abroad it is the sight of our soldiers and sailors and their magnificent achievements which have given me the greatest inspiration and the greatest encouragement for the future to the members of our armed forces to their wives mothers and fathers i want to affirm the great faith and confidence that we have in general marshall and in admiral king who direct all of our armed might throughout the world upon them falls the great responsibility of planning the strategy of determining where and when we shall fight both of these men have already gained high places in american history places which will record in that history many evidences of their military genius that cannot be published today some of our men overseas are now spending their third christmas far from home to them and to all others overseas or soon to go overseas i can give assurance that it is the purpose of their government to win this war and to bring them home at the earliest possible time we here in the united states had better be sure that when our soldiers and sailors do come home they will find an america in which they are given full opportunities for education and rehabilitation social security and employment and business enterprise under the free american system and that they will find a government which by their votes as american citizens they have had a full share in electing the american people have had every reason to know that this is a tough and destructive war on my trip abroad i talked with many military men who had faced our enemies in the field these hard-headed realists testified to the strength and skill and resourcefulness of the enemy generals and men whom we must beat before final victory is won the war is now reaching the stage where we shall all have to look forward to large casualty lists dead wounded and missing war entails just that there is no easy road to victory and the end is not yet in sight i have been back only for a week it is fair that i should tell you my impression i think i see a tendency in some of our people here to assume a quick ending of the war that we have already gained the victory and perhaps as a result of this false reasoning i think i discern an effort to resume or even encourage an outbreak of partisan thinking and talking i hope i am wrong for surely our first and most foremost tasks are all concerned with winning the war and winning a just peace that will last for generations the massive offensives which are in the making both in europe and the far east will require every ounce of energy and fortitude that we and our allies can summon on the fighting fronts and in all the workshops at home as i have said before you cannot order up a great attack on a monday and demand that it be delivered on saturday less than a month ago i flew in a big army transport plane over the little town of bethlehem in palestine tonight on christmas eve all men and women everywhere who love christmas are thinking of that ancient town and of the star of faith that shone there more than nineteen centuries ago american boys are fighting today in snow-covered mountains in malarial jungles on blazing deserts they are fighting on the far stretches of the sea and above the clouds and fighting for the thing for which they struggle i think it is best symbolized by the message that came out of bethlehem on behalf of the american people your own people i send this christmas message to you to you who are in our armed forces in our hearts our prayers for you and for all your comrades in arms who fight to rid the world of evil we ask god's blessing upon you upon your fathers mothers wives and children all your loved ones at home 
we ask that the comfort of god's grace shall be granted to those who are sick and wounded and to those who are prisoners of war in the hands of the enemy waiting for the day when they will again be free and we ask that god receive and cherish those who have given their lives and that he keep them in honor and in the grateful memory of their countrymen for ever god bless all of you who fight our battles on this christmas eve god bless us all keep us strong in our faith that we fight for a better day for humankind here and everywhere end of section twenty nine Section 30 of The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Engel. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. June 5, 1944. My friends, Yesterday, on June 4, 1944, Rome fell to American and Allied troops. The first of the Axis capitals is now in our hands, one up and two to go. It is perhaps significant that the first of these capitals to fall should have the longest history of all of them. The story of Rome goes back to the time of the foundations of our civilization. We can see there monuments of the time when Rome and the Romans controlled the whole of the then known world. That, too, is significant, for the United Nations are determined that in the future no one city and no one race will be able to control the whole of the world. In addition to the monuments of the older times, we also see in Rome the great symbol of Christianity, which has reached into almost every part of the world. There are other shrines and other churches in many places, but the churches and shrines of Rome are visible symbols of the faith and determination of the early saints and martyrs, that Christianity should live and become universal. And tonight it will be a source of deep satisfaction that the freedom of the Pope and the Vatican City is assured by the armies of the United Nations. It is also significant that Rome has been liberated by the armed forces of many nations. The American and British armies, who bore the chief burdens of battle, found at their sides our own North American neighbors, the gallant Canadians, the fighting New Zealanders from the far South Pacific, the courageous French and the French Moroccans, the South Africans, the Poles, and the East Indians, all of them fought with us on the bloody approaches to the city of Rome. The Italians, too, forswearing a partnership in the Axis, which they never desired, have sent their troops to join us in our battles against the German trespassers on their soil. The prospect of the liberation of Rome meant enough to Hitler and his generals to induce them to fight desperately, at great cost of men and materials, and with great sacrifice to their crumbling eastern line and to their western front. No thanks are due to them if Rome was spared the devastation which the Germans wreaked on Naples and other Italian cities. The Allied general maneuvered so skillfully that the Nazis could only have stayed long enough to damage Rome at the risk of losing their armies. But Rome is, of course, more than a military objective. Ever since before the days of the Caesars, Rome has stood as a symbol of authority. Rome was the Republic. Rome was the Empire. Rome was and is, in a sense, the Catholic Church. And Rome was the capital of a united Italy. Later, unfortunately, a quarter of a century ago, Rome became the seat of fascism, one of the three capitals of the Axis. For this quarter century, the Italian people were enslaved. They were degraded by the rule of Mussolini from Rome. They will mark its liberation with deep emotion. In the north of Italy, the people are still dominated and threatened by the Nazi overlords and their fascist puppets. Our victory comes at an excellent time while our allied forces are poised for another strike at western europe and while the armies of other nazi soldiers nervously await our assault and in the meantime our gallant russian allies continue to make their power felt more and more from a strictly military standpoint we had long ago accomplished certain of the main objectives of our italian campaign the control of the islands the major islands 
the control of the sea lanes of the Mediterranean to shorten our combat and supply lines, and the capture of the airports, such as the great airports of Phogia, south of Rome, from which we have struck telling blows on the continent, the whole of the continent, all the way up to the Russian front. It would be unwise to inflate in our own minds the military importance of the capture of Rome. We shall have to push through a long period of greater effort and fiercer fighting before we get into Germany itself. The Germans have retreated thousands of miles, all the way from the gates of Cairo through Libya and Tunisia and Sicily and southern Italy. They have suffered heavy losses, but not great enough yet to cause collapse. Germany has not yet been driven to surrender. Germany has not been driven to the point where she will be unable to recommence world conquest a generation hence. Therefore, the victory still lies some distance ahead. That distance will be covered in due time, have no fear of that. But it will be tough, and it will be costly, as I have told you many, many times. In Italy, the people have lived so long under the corrupt rule of Mussolini that, in spite of the tinsel at the top, you have seen the pictures of him, their economic condition had grown steadily worse. Our troops have found starvation, malnutrition, disease, a deteriorating education, and lowered public health, all by-products of the fascist misrule. The task of the Allies in occupation has been stupendous. We have had to start at the very bottom, assisting local governments to reform on democratic lines. We have had to give them bread to replace that which was stolen out of their mouths by the Germans. We have had to make it possible for the Italians to raise and use their own local crops. We have to help them cleanse their schools of fascist trappings. I think the American people as a whole approve the salvage of these human beings who are only now learning to walk in a new atmosphere of freedom. Some of us may let our thoughts run to the financial cost of it. Essentially, it is what we can call a form of relief, and at the same time we hope that this relief will be an investment for the future, an investment that will pay dividends by eliminating fascism, by ending any Italian desires to start another war of aggression in the future, and that means that they are dividends which justify such an investment, because they are additional supports for world peace. The Italian people are capable of self-government. We do not lose sight of their virtues as a peace-loving nation. We remember the many centuries in which the Italians were leaders in the arts and sciences, enriching the lives of all mankind. We remember the great sons of the Italian people, Galileo and Marconi, Michelangelo and Dante, and incidentally that fearless discoverer who typifies the courage of Italy, Christopher Columbus. Italy cannot grow in stature by seeking to build up a great militaristic empire. Italians have been overcrowded within their own territories, but they do not need to try to conquer the lands of other peoples in order to find the breath of life. Other peoples may not want to be conquered. In the past, Italians have come by the millions into the United States, they have been welcomed, they have prospered, they have become good citizens, community and governmental leaders. They are not Italian Americans, they are Americans, Americans of Italian descent. The Italians have gone in great numbers to the other Americas, Brazil and the Argentine, for example, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. They have gone to many other nations in every continent of the world, giving of their industry and their talents and achieving success and the comfort of good living and good citizenship. Italy should go on as a great mother nation, contributing to the culture and the progress and the goodwill of all mankind, developing her special talents in the arts and crafts and sciences, and preserving her historic and cultural heritage for the benefit of all peoples. We want and expect the help of the future Italy toward lasting peace. All the other nations opposed to fascism and Nazism ought to help to give Italy a chance. The Germans, after years of domination in Rome, left the people in the Eternal City on the verge of starvation. We and the British will do, and are doing, everything we can to bring them relief. Anticipating the fall of Rome, we made preparations to ship food supplies to the city, 
but, of course, it should be borne in mind that the needs are so great, the transportation requirements of our armies so heavy, that improvement must be gradual. But we have already begun to save the lives of the men, women, and children of Rome. This, I think, is an example of the efficiency of your machinery of war, the magnificent ability and energy of the American people in growing the crops, building the merchant ships, in making and collecting the cargoes, in getting the supplies over thousands of miles of water, and thinking ahead to meet emergencies. All this spells, I think, an amazing efficiency on the part of our armed forces, all the various agencies working with them, and American industry and labor as a whole. No great effort like this can be a hundred percent perfect, but the batting average is very, very high. And so I extend the congratulations and thanks tonight of the American people to General Alexander, who has been in command of the whole Italian operation, to our General Clark and General Lease of the Fifth and Eighth Armies, to General Wilson, the Supreme Allied Commander of the Mediterranean Theater, to General Devers, his American deputy, to General Aker, to Admirals Cunningham and Hewitt, and to all their brave officers and men. May God bless them and watch over them, and over all of our gallant fighting men. End of section 30《Section 31 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. June 23, 1944 all our fighting men overseas today have their appointed stations on the far-flung battlefronts of the world we at home have ours too we need we are proud of our fighting men most decidedly but during the anxious times ahead let us not forget that they need us too it goes almost without saying that we must continue to forge the weapons of victory the hundreds of thousands of items large and small essential to the waging of war this has been the major task from the very start and it is still a major task this is the very worst time for any war worker to think of leaving his machine or to look for a peacetime job and it goes almost without saying too that we must continue to provide our government with the funds necessary for waging war not only by the payment of taxes which after all is an obligation of american citizenship but also by the purchase of war bonds an act of free choice which every citizen has to make for himself under the guidance of his own conscience whatever else any of us may be doing the purchase of war bonds and stamps is something all of us can do and should do to help win the war i am happy to report tonight that it is something which nearly everyone seems to be doing although there are now approximately sixty seven million persons who have or earn some form of income eighty one million persons or their children have already bought war bonds they have bought more than six hundred million individual bonds their purchases have totaled more than thirty two billion dollars these are the purchases of individual men women and children any one who would have said this was possible a few years ago would have been put down as a starry-eyed visionary but of such visions is the stuff of american fashioned of course there are always pessimists with us everywhere a few here and a few there i am reminded of the fact that after the fall of france in nineteen forty i asked the congress for the money for the production by the united states of fifty thousand airplanes that year well i was called crazy it was said that the figure was fantastic that it could not be done and yet today we are building airplanes at the rate of one hundred thousand a year there is a direct connection between the bonds you have bought and the stream of men and equipment now rushing over the english channel for the liberation of europe there is a direct connection between your bonds and every part of this global war today tonight therefore on the opening of this fifth war loan drive it is appropriate for us to take a broad look at this panorama of world war 
for the success or the failure of the drive is going to have so much to do with the speed with which we can accomplish victory and the peace while i know that the chief interest tonight is centered on the english channel and on the beaches and farms in the cities of normandy we should not lose sight of the fact that our armed forces are engaged on other battle fronts all over the world and that no one front can be considered alone without its proper relation to all it is worth while therefore to make overall comparisons with the past let us compare today with just two years ago june nineteen forty two at that time germany was in control of practically all of europe and was steadily driving the russians back toward the ural mountains germany was practically in control of north africa and the mediterranean and was beating at the gates of the suez canal and the route to india italy was still an important military and supply factor as subsequent long campaigns have proved japan was in control of the western aleutian islands and in the south pacific was knocking at the gates of australia and new zealand and also was threatening india japan had seized control of most of the central pacific american armed forces on land and sea and in the air were still very definitely on the defensive and in the building up stage our allies were bearing the heat and the brunt of the attack in nineteen forty two washington heaved a sigh of relief that the first war bond issue had been cheerfully oversubscribed by the american people way back in those days two years ago america was still hearing from many amateur strategists and political critics some of whom were doing more good for hitler than for the united states two years ago but today we are on the offensive all over the world bringing the attack to our enemies in the pacific by relentless submarine and naval attacks and amphibious thrusts and ever mounting air attack we have deprived the japs of the power to check the momentum of our ever-growing and ever-advancing military forces we have reduced the japs shipping by more than three million tons we have overcome their original advantage in the air we have cut off from a return to the homeland tens of thousands of beleaguered japanese troops who now face starvation or ultimate surrender and we have cut down their naval strength so that for many months they have avoided all risk of encounter with our naval forces true we still have a long way to go to tokyo but carrying out our original strategy of eliminating our european enemy first and then turning all our strength to the pacific we can force the japanese to unconditional surrender or to national suicide much more rapidly than has been thought possible turning now to our enemy who is first on the list for destruction germany has her back against the wall in fact three walls at once in the south we have broken the german hold on central italy on june fourth the city of rome fell to the allied armies and allowing the enemy no respite the allies are now pressing hard on the heels of the germans as they retreat northwards in ever-growing confusion on the east our gallant soviet allies have driven the enemy back from the lands which were invaded three years ago the great soviet armies are now initiating crushing blows overhead vast allied air fleets of bombers and fighters have been waging a bitter war over germany and western europe they have had two major objectives to destroy german war industries which maintain the german armies and air forces and to shoot the german luftwaffe out of the air as a result german production has been whittled down continuously and the german fighter forces now have only a fraction of their former power this great air campaign strategic and tactical is going to continue with increasing power and on the west the hammer blow which struck the coast of france last tuesday morning less than a week ago was the culmination of many months of careful planning and strenuous preparation millions of tons of weapons and supplies and hundreds of thousands of men assembled in england are now being poured into the great battle in europe i think that from the standpoint of our enemy we have achieved the impossible we have broken through their supposedly impregnable wall in northern france but the assault has been costly in men and costly in materials some of our landings were desperate adventures but from advices received so far 
the losses were lower than our commanders had estimated would occur we have established a firm foothold we are now prepared to meet the inevitable counter-attacks of the germans with power and with confidence and we all pray that we will have far more soon than a firm foothold americans have all worked together to make this day possible the liberation forces now streaming across the channel and up the beaches and through the fields and the forests of france are using thousands and thousands of planes and ships and tanks and heavy guns they are carrying with them many thousands of items needed for their dangerous stupendous undertaking there is a shortage of nothing nothing and this must continue what has been done in the united states since those days of nineteen forty when france fell in raising and equipping and transporting our fighting forces and in producing weapons and supplies for war has been nothing short of a miracle it was largely due to american teamwork teamwork among capital and labor and agriculture between the armed forces and the civilian economy indeed among all of them and every one every man or woman or child who bought a war bond helped and helped mightily there are still many people in the united states who have not bought war bonds or who have not bought as many as they can afford every one knows for himself whether he falls into that category or not in some cases his neighbors know too to the consciences of those people this appeal by the president of the united states is very much in order for all of the things which we use in this war everything we send to our fighting allies costs money a lot of money one sure way every man woman and child can keep faith with those who have given and are giving their lives is to provide the money which is needed to win the final victory i urge all americans to buy war bonds without stint swell the mighty chorus to bring us nearer to victory end of section thirty one end of the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt by franklin d roosevelt